Well, hi, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of recovery for just under 47 years. If I make it another two weeks, I uh, have an anniversary coming up. And for that, I'm really, really grateful. I hope you'll visit our uh, website. It's called Two Way Prayer and uh, see that piece of uh, AA history that kind of got lost somewhere along the way. I think you'll find it interesting and uh, really changed my life, and I hope it may do the same for you. You can also follow me on Facebook under the title Father Bill W. And if you have any suggestions for uh, any upcoming series that you'd like to see us do, or you have some comments on how uh, either two-way prayer or these podcasts are, are helping you in your own recovery, I'd love to hear from you. You can drop me a line at uh, two-way prayer at gmail.com, twowayprayer at gmail.com. We're continuing with our series on the spiritual origins of AA, and uh, what we're trying to look at here is, is how the 12 steps really emerged out of the Oxford group, and uh, what were the things they kept, and what were the things that they left behind. And our hope is that it may be of some help to you in your own recovery. I know it certainly was for me. Uh, for this series, we're using a 1938 book that was titled The Eight Points of the Oxford Group. Uh, it was written by an Australian Methodist minister. Uh, his name was C. Irving Benson. And uh, the good thing about it is you can download it for free on the internet if you want to study up and, and see what he had to say there. Or you can also buy a copy, a bound copy from uh, Amazon thing costs about 18 bucks or so. <clears throat> this episode is uh, focused on chapter four in Benson's book. Uh, and in, in that chapter, he's dealing with the four absolutes. Um, I, I don't think it was Benson's best chapter, but that's, that's my opinion. And uh, may, maybe you'll have a different one. Sometimes he can get a little bit preachy. And I understand in his old age, uh, he did that. I hope that doesn't happen to me. Um, <laughs> it can be kind of disastrous, but, uh, but anyway, uh, he did, does have some key things in there and, uh, towards the end of this podcast, we're, we're going to get into them. And, and I think he really hit on a, a very, uh, important note that I want to share with you. Anyway, I heard about the four absolutes when I was, uh, in recovery. Uh, I did, I didn't know much about them. I got sober in Detroit and it was kind of close to, uh, Akron and, um, Cleveland, where uh, the four absolutes uh, are, are still to this day kind of centered. And um, so I heard about them, but uh, never got into them in any depths until I really started studying the history of AA. And, and when I did that, I could see how very central they were uh, to the spirituality uh, that we come to call 12-step spirituality. That the twelve, excuse me, the, that the the four absolutes were really at the heart of the twelve step uh, process. Now, some people will tell you that uh, they're not a part of AA, and they would be right in that. Bill Wilson pretty much used the opposites uh, of of those words. The four absolutes are honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. <clears throat> You'll hear a lot about dishonesty and how dangerous that is, uh, selfishness, self-centeredness, and then uh, fear, uh, which is in Wilson's writing kind of the opposite of love. Um, well, Wil Wilson was, tried to kind of stay away from the four absolutes. Uh, he didn't like them. He thought they were too much for alcoholics to handle, particularly the word absolute uh, kind of struck a rebellious chord in him. Uh, but Dr. Bob was very fond of them. And uh, he said in his last major address uh, to AA, he said this, the four absolutes, as we called them, were the only yardsticks we had in the early days before the steps. Then he adds, I think the absolutes still hold good and can be extremely helpful. Bob actually thought so well of them that he was buried with them. If you get a chance to go out to uh, Akron, Ohio, and to visit his uh, his grave site there. 
you're going to see the four absolutes chiseled in stone uh, right next to his headstone. And uh, <clears throat> the absolutes, as I say, they're still important in, in, the, in the Ohio area. You go into a meeting, you're going to see the absolutes sometimes hanging on the walls. So uh, still very much alive up there. They, they publish a pamphlet called The Four Absolutes from the AA Central Office in Cleveland, and I'd encourage you to get a copy of those just uh, to see how, how, how they uh, influenced the uh, early AA program. <clears throat> now, there was a difference between AA in, as it emerged in Akron and in New York City, where, of course, Bob was in Akron and Bill was uh, in New York. <clears throat> and, and Bill had, had a lot more atheists and agnostics to deal with. And they were afraid of scaring people off too much with the God stuff. So they wanted to lighten up on it. And uh, in Cleveland and Akron, they, they weren't nearly as afraid uh, to confront people uh, with um, the, some deep uh, spirituality. And, and, and if they're going to talk spirituality, they were going to talk the absolutes. And interestingly, of course, uh, there were more people getting sober in Cleveland and in New York, excuse me, in Cleveland and in Akron than there were in New York City. And that's, uh, that's really pretty amazing. But at this point, <clears throat> a little history on the absolutes might be helpful for us. Uh, going back, they first appeared in a book titled The Principles of Jesus. And the book was written by Robert Speer. He was a Presbyterian missionary. Uh, and he published this book in 1902. And the book is based on the life of Jesus. And what he has uh, in there is a chapter uh, dedicated to uh, the, the four absolutes, as he called them. And his premise was that Jesus was absolutely honest, absolutely pure, absolutely unselfish, and absolutely loving. And that as followers of Jesus, we should be heading in that direction too. Those should be the standards by which we uh, judge ourselves and our lives and our actions. Not that we're going to be able to achieve them, but that that's the direction in which we uh, should head. <clears throat> now, Frank Bookman, the founder of the Oxford Group, uh, he was really attracted to those standards. Uh, one of his teachers had adopted them and and he then followed suit and adopted them as well. And, and he began to ask, what would the world be like if each person in it lived by those four standards? Uh, honesty, just to take honesty for a moment. Uh, corruption. Um, in, in some countries, it is just rampant. Uh, I had a chance to visit with some people from uh, foreign countries uh, when I was in Switzerland studying about the Oxford Group. And uh, the corruption piece was, was unbelievable. And it seems to be creeping into our country as well. Uh, so, so how different the world would be if everybody practiced uh, honesty. <clears throat> Bill Wilson was once asked, um, since you took the program from the Oxford group, much of it, where are the four absolutes in your program? And he responded, they are in steps six and seven. Now, I didn't learn that one. Uh, uh, I was in the program many years before I knew that. That at the heart of the, of the program, six and seven are right, in, right, right there in the middle. Uh, that's, where the, that's where he said he put the absolutes, uh, where we become entirely ready to have God remove everything that gets in the way of our relationship with him. That was a key insight for me, and I hope it may be for you. You know, six and seven are the shortest steps in, in the big book. Uh, they just deal with them in, in a couple of paragraphs. Uh, but in the 12 and 12, uh, Wil Wilson goes uh, quite a bit deeper there, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. <clears throat> so... Um, Another point I wanted to make is that um, the absolutes were used to take inventory. Um, 
So actually, six and seven, you kind of need to be a little bit familiar with them before you get to four and five. And uh, that's why you got to remember there were no steps, but there was this program, and much of it was based on the absolutes. So when it came time for uh, a new person to to do what, what we would call inventory, they were presented with the four absolutes, and they would be given a sheet of paper, and on one sheet would be honesty, second one would be purity, third on selfishness, fourth love. And they were asked to then write down where did they fall short in living up to these standards. So um, <clears throat> really, really important. I've, I've done a number of uh, fourth and fifth steps with people, um, particularly people who've relapsed a number of times and uh, it's not so much going over their full life again. They, they've done that a hundred times. They've perhaps analyzed themselves nearly to death. But w where do you stand in your relationship with God? Where where have you been dishonest uh, to yourself, to other people? Um, and to really dig in, where have you been unloving in, in your relationships? These, I think, are some of the really the deeper, more core issues that get, get to the heart of our programs and, and to our own hearts in terms of whether we are living joined with God or separated from God, joined with other people or separated from other people. I think that separation piece is what really goes to the heart of, uh, of, of alcoholism. So um, you might try that uh, next time you're working with a newcomer, uh, particularly if you're just looking for a simple method I mean, some of our uh, fourth step guides can go to 40, 50 pages, and it's just question after question. And not, not uh, you know, I, I don't know that it promotes um, real uh, reflection as, as well as just the, the simple question um, about, about your honesty and unselfishness, etc. So <clears throat> um, another question I wanted to get to before we uh, get to Benson. Uh, is this whole question of perfection, because uh, it's important. It's one of the big objections that you'll often hear about the four absolutes. It's, boy, I mean, it's still true today. That, that, that word just turns people uh, uh, upside down. Um, and and, and the, the expression that we say in, in many of our 12-step programs is, remember, it's progress and not perfection. But that's not really accurate. Uh, if you go back, it's not accurate historically uh, in terms of the of the of the Oxford group and and what their understanding was, nor was it of of the steps as Bill Wilson interpreted them. And here I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna look to the twelve and twelve where where he goes a little bit deeper into um, into these steps than he did in in writing the big book. And listen, listen to this in terms of perfection. In, in, in step six, he asks, how can we accept the entire implication of step six? Why that is perfection. Later, he says, we shall need to raise our eyes toward perfection and be ready to walk in that direction. Now, I think there's a real difference between aiming for perfection and knowing that you're going to fall short or just aiming for progress. And that kind of sets us up for, well, how much progress do I really want or need? See, the standard is absolute. I, I, I often use the uh, analogy of, uh, of, of like flying an airplane. And when you're doing that, you head for due north. Uh, and, and you correct your flight path as it veers a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right or east and west, uh, and you center it right back once again on true north. Well, that's the perfection. That's, that's who uh, God is. And, and we head towards that and we fail. All right, I fail daily. I have yet to spend a full day of my recovery 
being absolutely honest, pure, unselfish, and loving. But when I do my two-way prayer in the morning, that's what I look at. Where did I fall short? And that's where I need God's help in, uh, in, in correcting the direction of my life. And that's a, a good way, I think, for, for trying to stay humble, uh, which really means teachable. And, and I'm going to learn through my failures. Uh, Carl Jung said something I will never forget. He said, after midlife, success has nothing to teach a man that the only way we learn is through our failures, through our errors, through our mistakes. And um, if we can do that, then we set ourselves up for a pattern, a life pattern of continuing to learn, continuing to go deeper, continuing to aim for perfection and settle for progress, knowing that we're, we're never going to, uh, to reach it. So I hope that's not splitting hairs. I think it's really important um, because I think alcoholics, <coughs> we're pretty much all or nothing people. You know, and if you don't give us something worthy of shooting for, eh, we'll kind of look and say, well, what the hell? Uh, that's, that's not worthy of me. But if you, if you set the standard really high and then uh, uh, experience your falling short, and in your falling short, meet God. See, that's the important thing. See, in my two-way prayer, I, I listen for God's voice every day, and I write down the thoughts that come. And I, I show up almost every day, having having failed in some area of my life, and and I've never been yelled at, <laughs> I've ne I've never been shamed. It's always an invitation now to go a little bit deeper, uh, to take more of God's help than I was willing to ask for uh, prior to that. And 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 the fourth point I wanted to make uh, before getting to Benson is that. Uh, the four absolutes, in addition to being what inventory was about, they're also what two-way prayer is about. There was a fellow by the name of James Hauk, and if some of you uh, know Wally P., uh, Wally was the author of um, Back to Basics, and Wally has gone around the country for uh, many years now, um, teaching, teaching the Back to Basics, teaching the simple program uh, of the steps, as uh, as they were developed, particularly in Cleveland, uh, when they were there was uh, a mass influx of alcoholics, and they had to get people through the through the process uh, pretty quickly. Well, somewhere along the line, he ran into a fellow by the name of James Hauk while he did, and uh, and discovered that Hauk had gotten sober back in 1934, one day after Bill Wilson had gotten sober, and he knew Bill Wilson. And uh, Wilson would come to meetings in uh, Maryland where he was living. Uh, and uh, he would ask, have you got any alcoholics here? And, and uh, James, James said, Wilson was always interested in helping alcoholics, but not so much in helping other people. And the Oxford group, you see, was intending to change everybody and anybody and not just alcoholics. So that, that, was, that was the big difference. And um, uh, James came to Austin two or three times. Uh, gosh, he was in his, his 90s uh, when he was coming. I'd always go and hear him speak because I figured, well, this is the last time I'm going to get to hear old James. And then a couple of years later, there, there he is again. He actually lived to be uh, over 100. And uh, I've never done this for anybody else, but I, I just got on an airplane and, and went to uh, – uh, Maryland to his home, and uh, uh, and they were throwing a big party for him at his hundredth birthday, and uh, he danced on the stage. Uh, James was an amazing man. Anyway, one time before that, I had stopped at his home to visit with him, and I was real interested in two way prayer, and I and I I wanted to know some uh, tricks of the trade, if you will, uh, about about how you do two way prayer. And, and <clears throat> James kind of disappointed me initially because what he said was, Bill, two-way prayer is all about the absolutes. And I was looking for a gimmick or a, a way to do it differently. Or, he said, it's, no, no, it's all about the absolutes. 
And while I left there maybe a little bit disappointed in, in my own ignorance, uh, over the years I found, well, James had it right. Two-way prayer is all about the absolutes. It's getting more honest with myself, more pure with my thoughts and, and uh, my body. And uh, it's not just sexual, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's purity of the heart, purity of the mind, purity of the spirit, purity of the emotions, you know, and, uh, and, and, and love. Is, is love uh, really starting to be the place uh, from which I am coming uh, inside? And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. <clears throat> so, and, and probably time to get to that, because this is the key that I took away from uh, Benson's chapter. Because uh, ben, what Benson says there that, that really, um, um, I think, is a, is a brilliant insight. He says that the absolutes are all about love. That love itself is honest, love is pure, love is unselfish. And here's a quote from uh, Benson. It says, the Oxford group insists on the indispensable necessity of daily checking that we are absolutely yielded to love in thought, word, and deed. The three other absolutes, honesty, purity, and unselfishness, are qualities of love. <clears throat> like light, he says, love is a compound. Just as the scientist takes a beam of light and by passing it through a crystal prism splits it up into its compound colors, so love may be broken up into the elements of honesty, purity, and unselfishness. <coughs> I was at a meeting in uh, early recovery, and the subject, I mean, I've been to thousands and thousands of meetings. I, I can't remember uh, the vast majority of them. This one I will never forget. The subject was, uh, what do you think lies at the root of your alcoholism? And, you know, some people said, well, it's, it, at the, my root, it's selfishness. And somebody else said, at, at, at the root, I think it's my immaturity. Uh, and a woman was there, and, and she said this, and I've never forgotten it. She said, I think at the root of my alcoholism is a love disorder. And man, did that hit me. I knew she was telling the truth. I knew she was telling my story. Uh, that, that, that at my core, I was missing something. And what I was missing was love. The ability to love other people, the ability to let you love me, the ability to love myself, to love God, to love my neighbor. Um, I mean, that thing from the scriptures, you know, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, if I loved my neighbor as myself, I might shoot the son of a gun because that's the way I felt about myself. And so when she said it was a love disorder, I knew she was, she was really, really on uh, to a, a very large truth. And when I left treatment the, the last time, one of the things that they told me was that if I didn't find something that felt better than alcohol or drugs, then I was probably going to return to them. And what I've discovered over the years is that love feels better, uh, love that's honest, love that's pure, love that's unselfish. It's not just emotional love. Uh, it's, it's, it's a deep, deep love. And um, it's a love that opens me to God's presence in my life, in my heart, and to his presence in you. And I can see him in you and feel him in you. I can feel him in the drunk who stumbles in the door. I can feel him in the, in the person who's standing on the corner waiting for, a, you know, flying a sign and trying, trying to, you know, get a few bucks. Um, uh, in AA, we say that the great reality is within. And I believe that the great reality is the love that's in us. Scripture says God is love. And here's what Benson writes. It says, we learn to love 
by receiving Christ into our hearts by faith. The love which we then have is not our love. It is the love of Christ expressing itself in us and through us. As St. Paul says, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And Benson kind of adds this then. He says, I love, yet not I, but Christ loves in me. So as we go through that second surrender, you know, you do your first surrender in step three. Um, alcohol has just whipped our, whipped our butts. And, uh, and so we're turning our life and our will over to, to God's care. But then later there's a second surrender. And that's the surrender we do in, in step seven. And that's what they did in early AA. Uh, they'd have that first surrender, maybe in the hospital. But then a few weeks later, when, when the person came, came back home and was, was they'd ask, are you serious about this thing? And they'd uh, then present them with the honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Are you willing to begin living by those standards? Uh, um, let's see. Uh, anyway, I think that's, that's, uh, that, that really helped me understanding that, helped me understand what steps, se- steps excuse me, six and seven are really all about, uh, knowing that the absolutes lay at the very heart of these steps. And sure is easier to try to keep track of four things than of 27 things. So am I living a life of honesty? Am I living a life of purity? Am I living a life of unselfishness? Am I living a life of love? Where I find that I am not, then I bring that to God and I ask God's help in uh, bringing those to me. So um, it's a way, I think, uh, that of, of keeping uh, recovery fresh and growing and changing. Uh, sometimes people get, uh, get bored with AA. Is this all there is? And uh, I think if you're living your life by the absolutes and trying to change your heart on a daily basis, trying to make God more present in your life uh, and love more real uh, as, as a living action, within yourself. It's God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. So anyway, I hope uh, some of this has been helpful to you. If it has, uh, please share this podcast with a friend and uh, check out our two-way prayer website if you haven't done so and um, start listening to that love that's uh, the voice of love that is inside each and every one of us. Uh, God loves you and uh, he has a plan for your life. And if you will listen to that, uh, you're going to find the meaning and purpose that uh, every alcoholic, every addict really needs to find that's beyond just staying sober. So again, hope this was helpful. God bless. Keep coming back.